Amen. Yes, you can shout to victory even on a Wednesday night. Even on a Wednesday night. Luke chapter 12, turn there with me. In the word, tonight's message is entitled, The Illusion of Home. The Illusion of Home. We have uh, learned so far in our, in our series, Transfer of Treasure, uh, of different things that is, are, are true uh, in terms of our, our giving. We've learned that it's a matter of obedience. Um, we're not owners of what we've been given. We're stewards of what we've been given. God is the owner. We've learned that giving compounds our joy. It fills us with joy. We know the saying, it's more blessed to give than receive, and Paul credits Jesus with that saying, um, but sometimes it, many times it takes us having to give first, then experiencing the joy, um, and up until that time, we kind of question it, but God loves a cheerful giver. We learn that giving transfers our wealth to heaven. We learn that while you can't keep any of it, you can send it on ahead. That the rewards in heaven are real, that the treasures in heaven are real, just as heaven is real, that treasure, treasures in heaven is God's idea. And while we may agree with these things, we still sometimes experience a roadblock when it comes to our giving. Something, guys, sounds a little... Um, over the top. <laughs> I feel like the sound's going to explode up here. Oh, that's a lot better. Yeah, okay. Good, good. Um, the main cause that we find uh, causing a little bit of a roadblock when it comes to our giving is that in many cases, we still consider this earth our home. We still consider this earth our home. Our first key tonight, you see there at the top of your handout, is that heaven and the future new earth, not this fallen earth, is my home. I'll say that again. Heaven and the future new earth, not this fallen earth, is my home. Let's pray, and we'll look at our key verse tonight. Lord, thank you for this time. Help us to remember that we're just passing through this place called earth, and we're marching on into glory. And Lord, we look forward to the day that we'll see you face to face, the day that our faith becomes sight. In the meantime, Lord, help us to uh, live and give in light of this reality that heaven is our home, that we don't belong here anymore. We're simply serving as ambassadors for you. Help us, Lord, to do that uh, with each and every day that you give us here on this planet. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The key verse... Um, and we'll jump around as we have been doing. There's a lot to see about these things. But Luke 12, 15, Luke 12, 15 says, And he said unto them, Take heed, beware, watch out, and beware of covetousness. That's the desire of someone else's things. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Possesseth, sorry. Got my possessing form wrong there. Um, we agree with this. Yes, that's right. Amen. Preach on. We're with it, right? But sometimes we, oh, okay, that's nice. Thank you. Uh, praise the Lord. But sometimes our financial decisions, how we spend our money seems to indicate a different set of beliefs. We amen the preacher and live differently in the week, right? And that's not just true of giving. That happens in a lot of areas, too. But I'm focusing on those things. A study was done by the Barna Group, and they're well known for their, their surveys and research that they do, specifically with uh, evangelical issues. And one of them they looked at in was the area of giving. This was back in 2007, uh, which doesn't sound like an old number, but that's over a decade. That's over a decade old. I'm just like, whoa, okay. Um, they used to use those numbers for futuristic movies, and now that's a past number. 
Anyways, that has nothing to do with the message. Um, this, is what, this is what they found, that just 5% of all adults, and this was evangelicals and non-evangelicals alike, um, 5% of all adults surveyed said that they regularly tithe, that is, give a tenth of their income to the church. Of all the evangelicals surveyed in that group, only 24% said that they regularly tithe. Okay, one in four. Um, among all adults who claim to be born again, only 9% contributed one-tenth or more of their income. In terms of general giving and donations, evangelical Christians far outgave other groups as over 80% of Christians, evangelical Christians, gave more than $1,000 on average over the past year to their church. Um, I only give those figures to show that as a general rule, our ideas of giving have changed. And, and that's not pointing at any one particular person. That's kind of painting with a broad bro brush here, okay? I'm just trying to get us to think about these things. I believe that when we shift our thinking of where we're going to spend eternity our financial decisions will follow. And so tonight, I want to give you five shifts that are needed in our mentality to help adjust our financial decisions. Uh, again, this isn't personally picking on anyone. If anything, I'm putting myself in the mix too. We all need to hear these things. We all need to be reminded this world is not our home. Number one, we need to shift in our thinking from being a resident to being a pilgrim, from resident to pilgrim, okay? Um, all born-again believers know and love the fact that heaven will be our home for all eternity. But not all born-again believers live like it. First, let's see who the Bible says we are. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 that we're pilgrims and strangers, Pilgrims and strangers, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We love to call ourselves pilgrims. We don't always love to call ourselves strangers. That's why that's the blank you fill in. Because I want you to write it, I want you to see it, I want you to get it in your mind. Strangers is also a uh, foreigner. Foreigner. From another place. Um, and, and how might we as Christians be foreigners here? How is that possible? We're all born here. How is that possible? Somebody answer. Pop quiz. Because we're in the world but not of the world. Very good. Our citizenship changes. We, we willingly give up our citizenship here on this earth, here in this country, for a citizenship above. Um, I'm thankful for America. Now, this isn't some kind of anti-American message, don't get me wrong. But only Christ can truly give me freedom. I'm thankful that God brought about this land we know as America. Many great things were done for the cause of Christ because we have this land. But this land doesn't determine my eternal destination. Christ does in his work on Calvary. We're pilgrims and strangers, but number two, we're also ambassadors. Ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Job number one of every pilgrim and stranger that's passing through is be an ambassador for the Lord. Okay, An ambassador is a representative of another country. They advance the interests of of the country that they're from, not the country that they're in. You see what I mean? They represent the interests of their head of state. Okay? We had our State of the Union last night. That's all I'll say about that. But we have a head of state. They, we call him a president. 
Other heads of state have other titles. Hey, as citizens of heaven, we have a head of state, King Jesus. And we're called to represent his interests on this earth wherever we go. That brings me to my third point here, sub point rather, that we're citizens of heaven. Citizens of heaven. Hebrews eleven six. But now they desire a better country. A better country. America's nice, but heaven is better. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. Aren't you glad God's working on the construction and not you and me? (laughs) Oh, boy. If you were to travel abroad, would you bring all of your wealth and assets with you? Of course you wouldn't. Where you have your wealth and assets indicates where you believe your home to be. That is a challenging reality. Letter B. Where what's there that is in heaven is far greater than what's here. Okay? What's there? Let's talk about it. Number one, heavenly mansions. Heavenly mansions. Uh, John 14, 2, very clearly speaking, Jesus here, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, I will say, uh, some people get a little rubbed the wrong way about that word mansions. They say that it doesn't really mean that. Um, they say that, that um, you know, he's not building us these big palatial mansions and that we're not supposed to think about that. And, uh, you know, I'm not here to debate whether that's what kind of mansion that is, okay? Because I just, you're going to find out eventually. <laughs> so, Why waste your time with silly debates? Um, Because here's the thing. While we may debate about the building, there is no debate about who the builder is. And if you know him as your Savior, that's the key factor. That's the key factor. Where we're headed, there is a mansion being prepared for us by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Number two, there's also a heavenly wedding. A heavenly wedding. Wedding. Weddings are magnificent. They're beautiful. They're, 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 even, even the simplest weddings are beautiful. Um, it, it just represents so much, and it's just nice to see a couple, you know, get married and, and say their vows and commit themselves one to another. Uh, but that wedding supper of the Lamb is going to be something to behold. I recently saw a post on social media. It said, while everyone on earth is headed toward a war, I'm headed toward a wedding. How true that is. We don't have to get all all tied up and bothered about what's happening over there in Europe. And certainly it's not an easy situation. And our heart heart and prayers and and all of that is is for them. And, uh, you know, there's there's, there's, uh, born-again believers in the midst of all that and missionaries, and and definitely our heart aches for that. We'd hate to see any country involved in that. But, my friend, that doesn't give me any uncertainty about the future. That doesn't give me any worry about what may come next. Is this the end of the world? My words are, even so, come Lord Jesus. The Bible describes it better revelation 19 7 to 9 let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints and he saith unto me right Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Who is he talking about? Who is the bride at this heavenly wedding? The church. The church. Hey, who's the church? We are. You better believe it. You better believe it. All those who have been born again are the bride of Christ, and we are headed to a wedding. We are headed to mansions. This is not our home. And how you live and how you give is a testament to what you truly believe. 
Once these truths enlighten your mind, your heart will no longer struggle to transfer your treasure to your everlasting home. Number two, you've also got to shift from the dot to the line. From the dot to the line. Stay with me. It's been said, he who dies with the most toys still dies. It's a reality for believers and unbelievers alike. Death is no respecter of persons. Certainly, we hope to be caught up together to meet Him in the clouds. But if that doesn't happen, we will go the way of all the earth. This physical body will perish. The Bible speaks clearly on this matter also in Hebrews chapter 9. The Bible says in 927, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And I'm glad it doesn't stop there, because verse 28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The hope of salvation for all who believe is not only possible, but it is sufficient. Christ died once to purchase our salvation. We only need to place our faith in Him once to make that salvation secure. And it can never be plucked out of my Father's hands. I'm so thankful for that reality. But what does that have to do with thinking about a line and thinking about a dot? Okay, Letter A, we must understand there are two phases of life. Two phases of life. Uh, The first phase is our life we live here on earth, and that's summarized by a dot. Can you make that noise? Oh, that's better. Forrest was way better. Maybe Maybe I'm just dehydrated. I don't know. I don't know if we got that audio on the live stream or not. A dot. Okay. That's it. You might also see it represented as a dash on your tombstone. That space between the time you're born and the time you die. It has a beginning. It has an ending. The line is the other phase. That's eternity. That's a line that begins at the end of your life here and then never ends. Whether whether you believe in Christ or not, by the way, you're going to spend an eternity somewhere away from God in hell and damnation, uh, everlasting judgment and punishment and fire and brimstone and all those things, uh, torment, everlasting torment, uh, yet with the understanding of of where you went wrong. I mean, it's got to be absolute torture. And and people who reject Christ in this life are going to be there. Um, But people who believe in Christ are going to be with God for eternity, worshiping Him praising Him, living in His glorious presence. There's no need of a son there. Our God, the God of the universe, lights it all up. Just Himself alone. There is no need of these things. That is the line. Now, some people talk about that dash on the tombstone or that dot between when you're born and when you die, and they say, you know, make the most of it. Life is but a vapor. And that's true. That's a great idea, but it's better to consider the line. Because when you consider the line, it will help you to live better in the dot. To live better, to give better, to to worship better, to pray better, to study better, to grow better. All things go better when you consider your home is in heaven And the better I represent my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ well here, the more people can come with me to this place. You get a couple bonus keys tonight, and your second one is is on your worksheet, letter B. I should not live for the dot, but for the line. When you give to the work of the Lord... You're living for the line. Letter C, know this, toys are for the junkyard. (laughs) Toys are for the junkyard. All gains in this life, physically speaking, are erased at our death. All our possessions become someone else's. And eventually, 
They end up in a heap somewhere. Even the greatest civilizations that have come before us are buried under tons of dirt, and they just look like big hills. In Israel, they call them a tell, T-E-L. And if you were to dig into that, you could excavate these ancient civilizations and maybe even find some precious stones and whatever of value. But probably when they lived, they thought they were it, man. They thought they were hot stuff. But we live today and look at that and see a grassy knoll. What do you think is going to happen to our stuff when we're gone? Well, I'm going to leave it to my kids. What do you think they're going to do with it? They're not going to like it like you liked it. They're going to sell off whatever's of value, and they'll keep a couple of keepsake things that have no value. That's what happens. That's what happens. So maybe it could get invested in a better way. I'm just saying, let's think about these things. Jim Elliott, I talked about him last Sunday in my Bible study class and the preaching. He said he is no fool who gains what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Transmuting, transferring our treasure here to our treasure there. It's a very real process. It's not overly spiritual to say something like that. It's not just said because it sounds good. It's said because it's true. Jesus says in Luke 18, 22, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. This young man had it all. And he forsook heavenly treasure for earthly treasure. That's exactly what he did. And he went away sad. One of the only people to encounter Jesus Christ and to go away sad. All because of his possessions. We feel sorry for him, but what would we do if we were given the same choice? We would like to think that we would sell everything and give it away. But we have trouble thinking about doing that right now. <laughs> we say, I'm glad that's a story in the Bible and not something I have to do in my life. How tightly do we hang on to our toys? One day they're going to end up in the junkyard anyways. So think about that. Number three, shift from burden to blessing. From burden to blessing. This was actually funny because... Um, I used these terms in a previous series this year, and so maybe these terms are just stuck in my head. I don't know. Um, Maybe I just have a limited vocabulary, but um, do do you have your things or do your things have you? Are they a burden when you thought they would be a blessing? There was a story of a man who who just looked sad. He just looked like he had a terrible day, and um, the, this other man saw him at the airport. He goes up to him, strikes straight, straight up a conversation. Hey, man, you doing okay? What is everything all right? And he's like, Yeah, I just found out. I got all these problems with my other house down in Florida, and I was gonna have the weekend to myself, and now I've got to fly down and oversee these projects at my house in Florida to make sure that everything's okay there. And the guy's like. Okay, I'm sorry you're so down about your second house. And then, he, and then he walked off, and the guy got on his private jet and flew off to Florida. And this man, who had a life that many of us might dream of having, didn't have control of his own time because his stuff had control of him. PBS once did a special called Affluenza affluenza, detailing America's addiction to stuff. They said that the average American shops six hours a week while giving 40 minutes to playing with their children. In in any given year, more Americans declare bankruptcy than graduate from college. That's something to think about. In 90% of divorce cases... Arguments about money play a prominent role. I don't think the people who are focused on building their stuff here have it better off. 
In fact, let me give you some quotes from some well-known millionaires and billionaires. Mr. Vanderbilt, that's a popular name. He said, the care of 200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. You say, I don't know, Mr. Vanderbilt. Let me hang on to that 200 million. I'll let you know if I'm having any pleasure or not. Mr. Ford, Henry Ford, does ring a bell? He said, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. Hmm. John D. Rockefeller, now I know you've heard that name. Okay. He said, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Hmm. The only true way for your stuff to bless you is to give it away. It's to give it away. Know this, and you may even want to write this down. It's not on your sheet. Pilgrims travel light. Pilgrims travel light. Number four, the fourth shift we need to make is from tyranny to treasure. From tyranny to treasure. Now, I've mentioned treasure every single message, but I haven't said tyranny yet. What I'm talking about is the tyranny of things, the tyranny of things. There's a story out there of a middle-aged couple. They lived in their house a very long time, and they had the same carpet from when they moved in, and it was old when they moved in, and as long as they've been there, it's even older. Uh, You know, the carpet's been there longer than they have, and they get a spill, no big deal. They just clean it up and go on with their lives. Well, they finally decided, you know what? We're going to splurge a little bit. We're going to put new carpet in. And they were so happy until the end of the first week of having the brand new carpet. They lit a candle to put a nice smell in the living room. And the top of that candle fell off and burned a hole in their brand new carpet. And some of you guys are just going, oh, I felt that one. I felt that one. That's happened to me. And they were furious. When the week before, if they spilled Kool-Aid, they could have cared less. What happened? Before the carpet was included, this time they paid their own money for this stuff. At one point, they had to ask themselves, are we really better off with better carpet? It's simplistic, I understand, but I'm just trying to illustrate how when we put our money into things, we care about them, don't we? Whenever you purchase a new possession, that new possession redefines your priorities. Okay? You get a new television, next thing you know, your recliner's a little lumpy. I feel like I could watch this TV better in a new recliner. I I can't quite hear it as well. I think the sound would be better with some new speakers. You see what I mean? Okay, uh, you get a new uh, pleasure craft, a, a motorhome, a, a motorcycle, or some kind of toy, or, or whatever. Uh, and, and next thing you know, Sunday comes around, and, and your buddies are going out for this awesome ride, but you serve in a ministry in the church, and now you have a conflict, and maybe you go ride this time, and th- that time you serve. What happened? Your priorities got redefined. From a piece of machinery... That machinery is not going to heaven. But that little child you could have shared the gospel with at church does have an eternal soul. What's more valuable? Those are, the que- those are real life things. I had a motorcycle. I loved riding that thing. The wind in my locks as I'm going down the highway. It's just freedom. And my wife was so glad when we sold it. <laughs> Look, they're not bad things, but they do force you to make bad choices. This is the tyranny of things. Luke 12, 20, Jesus puts it, God puts it plainly, it says. They're one and the same, you know what I mean, but specifically God is mentioned here. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided This man wanted a bigger barn for his stuff. He cared more about his stuff than his soul. God says, you missed it. Your soul's going this way. Your barn's staying here. Invest in what matters. Invest in what has eternal returns. Number five, final one. Shift from chasing the wind 
to chasing the Lord. Shift from chasing the wind to chasing the Lord. Solomon, richest man ever. Wisest man ever. Had a lot of things to say in the book of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. But I'm going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5. You could turn there if you like. Verse 10 says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. In other words, the more you have, the more you want. You'll never be satisfied with stuff. Verse 11, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The more you have, the more people around you will want what you have, and the more you will realize how meaningless it all truly is. How many millionaires and billionaires have ended their life in suicide? Suicide with possessions we'll never own in our lifetime. And yet none of that was enough. Verse 12, the sleeping of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. The more you have, the more worry you have. There is a sore evil, verse 13 says, which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. The more you have, the more pain you have. Your stuff can hurt you. Verse 14, but those riches perish by evil travail. And he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. The more you have, the more you have to lose. Verse 15, And as he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. The more you have, the more you leave behind. Solomon tried everything and had nothing. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, he says, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. What a miserable statement. From a blessed man. He speaks nothing of his possession in the Lord. Only on his stuff. Interesting. If you will chase the Lord instead of chasing the wind, consider what Paul tells to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, that is, proud in their stuff. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works. Rich in good works, not in a lot of stuff. Did you notice that distinction? Ready to distribute, not gain, give away. Uh, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. Uh, that they may lay hold on eternal life. You see, um, there's nothing wrong with being rich, and I'm not up here saying that rich people are evil or any such thing. I am saying that riches can be a snare just as much as any other substance out there. And it has become a snare. And you have to, you have to watch out. You have to watch out. Uh, another bonus key for you. Giving is the only antidote to materialism. Giving is the only antidote to materialism. You claim it's just stuff, give it away. See if it hurts. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> you want to show God how you really believe he's the owner of all things? Don't make the same mistake as the rich young ruler. C.S. Lewis made a comparison about these things. He said, We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea, we are far too easily pleased. 
When you compare the riches of earth and the riches of heaven, there is no comparison. Because this is what's going to happen. Let me give you some prophecy here. 2 Peter 3.10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Amen. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, the earth also, the earth also. And the works that are therein, and the works that are therein, shall be, what's the last two words? Burned up. Burned up. So worse than your toys going to a junkyard, they're going to a burn pit. Think about that. Think about that. A Christian whose heart is in the right place, when you hear these things, it's confirmation of what you know to already be true. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Your home here is only illusion, an illusion. And the home awaiting you in heaven is far more glorious. Next week, we'll talk about where to begin with these things. Once you get this idea of this place as your home out of your head, and you're like, I'm, I'm ready. Let's do this. We'll talk about that next Wednesday night. Let's pray, and we'll sing about the sweet by and by. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Oh, how it ministers to our heart to, to hear what you think about stuff, what you think about possessions on this earth, uh, treasure in heaven, treasure on earth, all of those things. The world has so much to say, so many ways for us to spend and invest and save and all those kinds of things. But instead, you just want our heart because you know that where our heart is, there our treasure will be also. Help us, Lord, not to just claim a desire to, to give and to live for you, but to live that out as well, to be consistent in our lifestyle as our words. And in this way, we will honor you. We will give to your kingdom. We will invest in treasures that are to come, for the treasures that are to come are far greater and will last for eternity. Help us to think about that tonight, Lord. Work in our hearts in a special way. Help us to think about heaven in a fresh new way. Oh, a heavenly wedding. Oh, heavenly mansions, I cannot wait. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.